Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And this one is going to be the roundup for 2022. All the costs involved with the restoration work, the new cars that arrived. It's the Amira, Lotus, Fulvia Sport, the Zagatos came into the garage. Three bikes have gone. We had the restoration of Kuntash going on. All those sort of things I'm going to gather together and run you through some of the experience I've had with the cars and some of the costs involved. And the first car I'm going to start with is actually the star of last year's cost roundup, the Jaguar XJC V12 manual. Now, I was really looking forward to 2022 and having this Jaguar around. The trouble was it got teething issues almost from the start. And what it was, it has a very peculiar fueling setup at Jaguar XJs of this age. They have these twin tanks at the back here and you have a switch on the dash to choose either put in from the left hand tank or the right hand tank. So far so good. The issue comes with fuel injection. It sends a lot of fuel to the engine as maximum amount the engine might use but if you're only ticking over it doesn't use it all. So 80% of the fuel is coming back to the tank probably more 90% and you want it to return to the same tank that you're putting from. And there's these little valves here that control, when you press the switch on the dash, these swap it to the other tank. And I've never had issues with it before I did the restoration. Unfortunately, during the restoration, we thought we'd replace them with bona fide Jaguar Land Rover new issue parts to do the job they don't work we have gone through i don't know how many four or five valves going back and what happens is you're put in from the left hand tank and it's not returned to the left hand tank it's returned to the right hand tank and you suddenly smell petrol and it's just effervescing because the tank is full the engine's this valve hasn't opened and all the petrol is returned to a full tank so it just spills over here spills over the exhaust and i've had a number of lucky escapes when i've just smelt it in time or seen the whiffs of it and stopped and we haven't had a fire i've always carried a number of fire extinguishers in it because of this we've got round it Tom Lentford has really been pulling his hair out on this. There are American cars fitted with similar valves. They don't break. So we just got some American valves instead of using the, the reissued parts from Jaguar Land Rover because they're just rubbish. Now, it's not only the valve in and the tanks that has been causing issues with this car. <sighs> I've been having issues with fuel injectors as well. And the engine... It's so frustrating this because this engine is stunning. The way this car handles the manual gearbox, I can't tell you how exciting it is to drive now it's run up. If you've listened to the video as well, the sound it makes, everything's great about it. But what I'm finding, if I take it for a good hard drive, I get back in it the next day and suddenly, hang on a minute, we're not on 12 cylinders. And the issue has been the fuel injectors. Now, I put initially, I had a set rebuilt at vast expense, 2,000 something pounds, and went in there, running in, they were okay. Soon as I started to pu um, push it a bit harder, they started to misfire. They, these actually failed. I put another complete set of injectors in it, another 2,000 pounds, and it ran for a bit, and then it went down to 10 cylinders again. Deeply frustrating. We replaced those, and it's gone back and it went back to 12 for a, a day or two. And then we were actually going off to Heffel to see the Amira being built. Notice it had gone from 12 to 11 on the way across, turned around, gave up on it. And I haven't really been able to use this car as expected. Fortunately, there are now, I, I was in a queue for some rebuilt brand new injectors. They never arrived, but SNG Barrett, have just introduced new injectors which are a different system if i look at this they have the a disc type injector instead of the normal pintle um, type injector it just doesn't seem to be able to cope with modern fuels it, they just cease to work and they're unreliable 
So actually, yesterday's job was fitting all new 12 injectors. It was about a thousand pounds. There is a new injector. And when you take an old injector out, it looks like that. And I thought, oh no, that isn't gonna fit because this has got a much bigger collar on it. And that's actually how it's held in. If you look here, it's these plates, hold it in place and it sits on that collar. And if you look at this injector, well, it doesn't fit. It will just go straight through there and that won't actually hold it, that plate. So I thought, oh, these don't fit either. Fortunately, Tom Lempful was available and he sent through a video and said, well, actually what you do is you can strip this bit off and underneath you end up with an injector looking like that. There's an old injector, there's a new injector and they're identical. So we can continue and I'm gonna fit 12 in new injectors to this car and hopefully fingers crossed this will mean this car will spark in life and we'll be able to use the revs and we'll really get to enjoy it another thing that's happening to this car in 2023 is actually in a few weeks time i'm having the exhaust modified because the manifolds off the engine sit a bit low and they're the first thing to grind out i don't think that's a very good thing so i'm having a different exhaust system built up and it's going to have a cross pipe as well linking both sides of the engines so it might sound a bit different i think it might actually even improve the sound it makes but i won't have the ground clearance issue as well so anyway that's what's happening with the jaguar let's have a look at these others next the rolls royce hasn't had any expenditure on it this year the lambswell rugs arrived for it i've used it occasionally enjoyed every moment i take it outside the garage and i love also you just turn the key and it works i've been into london a couple of times that sort of thing unfortunately one little thing happened with it i lent it to a magazine and they were just turning around in a tight space and managed to put a slight dent in the sill so i've probably got to get that repaired in 2023 now jagra project 8 this last year had uh, that we were doing those 200 mile an hour runs on the autobahn we went out to germany etc i noticed after doing that run after i'd finished the video the it had a coolant light come up it was low coolant thought nothing much of it put some more coolant in it and actually when i arrived back home just came off the euro tunnel it came on again as we crossed europe we must have triggered it again it went in for a service last January time and turns out I was very lucky on that uh, autobahn experience because there's this hose and this hose is unique to a Project 8 and it goes across the front of the engine behind the radiators and it's actually a sort of, it's a, it's a gearbox oil cooler actually warms the oil as well so if you start it from a cold start it's a it's a heat transfer that either warms the uh, gearbox oil or cools it down depending on what sort of work it's doing and it, as i say it runs behind it runs across the engine bay behind the radiators just in front of the engine and while i was doing 200 miles an hour this hose moved closer the wind pressures it comes through the radiator were moved it closer to the engine and you will see there the pulley on the engine was actually hitting this hose and fortunately it didn't go all the way through but there could have been an incident on that autobahn at 200 plus miles an hour where the pulley had cut through this hose and i would have lost all my coolant it didn't happen thank goodness and I'm very glad that it was caught in time and this part is, you know, being replaced. But I've made SVO aware of this and obviously Jaguar, the garage is aware of it and they're checking all their Project 8s. Basically, all it needs is a retaining clip in the middle of this length to make sure it can never get anywhere close to the engine pulley powering the supercharger. But mine was replaced in time. But if you have got a Project 8, all 220 of us, and you are thinking of doing 200 plus miles an hour on a fairly regular basis, just put a cable tie around that. You'll do yourself a big favor. Other things with that, I had the car serviced, 1,456 pounds, 32,000 mile service. I didn't check it beforehand, but for whatever reason, they want all the brake hoses replacing. So you have the fixed brake hoses going front and rear, and when it actually goes off the wheels, a flexible Goodridge hose, and you have to replace them for some reason. No idea why, and they obviously check, 
change the brake fluid, etc. That's why it's quite an expensive service. And because of this incident, I've actually um, extended the warranty. So for £780 a year, you can extend the warranty. And just because it's such a unique car, I'm going to have it, I'm going to continue doing it because of things like that. The other thing with the Project 8, it's done a number of events. It's been to the MotoGP, it's been to the Grand Prix. My son borrows it and he's very proud of the stickers he's managed to collect over the year. And also the 1771 Bista, uh, going up to Bista Heritage, etc. The plan for 23 with the Project 8 is actually the give the car over to David Pook, who you might know from Alpine Life A110. He does chassis setup for the little Alpine. And he was project leader of the Project 8 at his time during JLR. And he keeps trying to get me to set it up for track mode. The, the Project 8 had these two modes. Normally it's in road going mode as you see it here, but there is a track mode as well. So he works in conjunction with Spires who are chassis setups experts and the Project 8 was going to go off to them. It's probably going to gain its rear wing as well. So I just want to drive it in its ultimate setup for track. So that's something for 2023. One other thing with the Project 8, I've owned this car for four years now. And when I first bought it, I actually put it on Jaguar Finance because I wasn't sure I was going to keep it at the end of the period. And it was quite a good balloon. It was £90,000. I thought, well, none of us know what a Project 8 is going to be worth in uh, four years' time. That's not a bad amount. Now you get to the point where four years is up. And I think I could get a fair bit more than £90,000 for this car. I really enjoy it what it offers i think it's unique and i see the sort of overweight c63s and things coming down the line and i do think it's what the characteristic it offers is going to get more special with time so i want to keep it so i had to refinance it and i have to thank uh, magnitude finance for arranging finance on this for the balloon payment and uh, so in three or four years time i will own it outright now project seven my stalwart of the garage, my go-to car for doing events or going across Europe or whatever. It has been, it's seven years now it's been in the garage and all you do, it's one of those cars you just put petrol in it and it just works and occasionally put tyres on it. Just had it serviced in 22, 385 pounds. It costs nothing to run this car and I like that a lot as you'll get to know as we go down the line. But for 23, we're just going to carry on using it like that. I, I still scratch my head why these cars have no sort of following and you never see a magazine doing group tests with them or whatever. This is, I just think we're, we're living for a time when there's massive change coming. We've got electrification coming. We've got particulate filters. We've got internal combustion engines basically dying and being outlawed. And there's things like the F-Type around waving at you in the classifieds and an early F-Type V8S or whatever or R, they're just bargains. You know, you can, yes, you can buy your Aston Martin, etc. but then you've got much higher running costs and yet a Jaguar, uh, Jaguar F-Type or Project 7 is so easy to live with and uh, costs nothing to run. So anyway, that's the, that's the Project 7. Now, as I've explained in previous videos, the F40 and F50 are not owned by me. They're here just from friends who needed some storage. And I haven't got the Countach here. And you might have spotted, I haven't got the Tessarossa here either. So they're just taking up the space while those two are absent from the garage. Just on the Countach, that is up at Ian Tyrrell's at the moment, having his gearbox rebuild and some refresh, done the chassis on it. Um, I've done, the heads have come off, etc. I had hoped it might be back in the garage by now, but there's been a delay on the gearbox rebuild. It's been very frustrating. Polo Storico are this new classic division of Lamborghini and Ian sourced the parts from them and it hasn't been absolutely straightforward. They supply the parts, but they'd modified one of the parts that meant you needed another part, but they didn't tell you that when you ordered the new part. So we had to wait for that to come in. Then they went off to the gearbox builder. He's discovered there are some manufacturing issues with the parts that have been supplied. So he's had to machine them to make them fit original shafts, etc. You don't want to know the details. That is the reason for the delay. 
and it's been very frustrating because Ian has not, the engine is all finished, everything's ready to go back in the car, but we need the gearbox rebuild completed, but it hasn't been a straightforward exercise. I should also mention, you'll notice that the Lamborghini Espada isn't in the garage either. And that one's had issues post rebuild. Ah, the, it, when we completed the running in period and started to exercise the car more, we discovered a sort of misfire at higher revs and it was just apparent. And it's taken forever to try and diagnose what it was. And again, it was parts, new parts supplied by Polo Storico from Lamborghini, brand new distributor head, brand new rotor arm inside the distributor head. And what we discovered was the rotor arm is a few mil shorter than standard and the spark was having to jump a huge distance from the end of the rotor arm onto the distributor. Ah, oh, so frustrating, just remanufactured but not the same as standard and just incompatible. So what we did, we then put a new, sorry, we put an old rotor arm in the setup with the new distributor head, suddenly the engine ran beautifully but then stopped after about 50 miles, took the distributor cap off and the rotor arm was destroyed because it was slightly too tall because it turned out the distributor cap was the wrong size as well. So we're, we've gone back to standard, but then we had points in that were remanufactured and they wore away and we got stuck down at Goodwood. I had to come back on a trailer with a car because it ran beautifully all the way down to Goodwood and then stopped on the way home. So frustrating, this remanufacturing of parts that you expect to be quality items, and I don't know where they're coming from, whether they're coming from China or whatever, but they not, are not up to the quality of the original parts that were fitted to these cars when they were new. Anyway, rant over, but that's what's going on with the two Lamborghinis. Porsche 930S. Now, we had the most amazing but the more I own this car the more special I realize it is and we had that trip basically running an engine in in Spain when it came back from there it went to Jazz Porsche Steve Winter because he really knows these cars and there was that's right when we actually came off I'd finished the recording of that Spanish trip I did mention this in a previous video the car had a slight misfire it was suddenly cut out as you're running along the motorway and well, I'll come back to life and when we came off the ferry, it did it in the passport queue. I ended up having to push it and start it and got it running. It was late at night thinking, are we going to get home? No, we're not. And it stopped on a smart motorway. Fortunately, I could just pull over just where a junction was and I was sort of on the hatch plate. It's a scary thing breaking down on a smart motorway at night, but uh, they put the lights up and we were rescued very quickly. It turned out to be a relatively simple component, just a relay. These cars were fitted with from new. They have a relay that you sometimes notice when you turn the car off, particularly when it's cold, the engine will continue to run for a few seconds and then cut off. And Porsche fitted this relay to keep the engine running just for a few seconds to protect the turbo, just to keep some oil going to the turbo. And it basically failed on this car. So, when the engine was in run mode, it was also cutting the engine. So it was a fairly easy thing to, um, to fix, but he also noticed that the boost um, hoses hadn't been set up correctly and he did quite a lot of work on it. I'm trying to think what else, he did, a, he did boost correction. I wanted to be able to heel and tow in it. He created some rods to bring the um, throttle closer. He did all the oil changes that all the, because basically the engine had, was. I was running it in, so this was the first service and a sort of fixing all the little things that needed doing. And I had new discs put on the front because they were slightly warped, all the wheels balanced, chassis dynamics. I did all the, um, checked all the um, measurements on it, etc. So quite a detailed list. And also the speedo, which we put a mile an hour speedo on it before discovering that I had a mile an hour speedo. Total bill, £4,800, which is quite a lot, but £700 of that was actually the speedo change that we then sent back to Porsche because I discovered I had a mile on a speedo. For 2023, I'm just going to carry on using it 
The one thing I'm going to do is just gaining some stone chips on those wide rear arches. I'm not a huge fan of PPF uh, protection, but I'm actually going to put it on this car to keep it absolutely as pristine as you see it here. So that's what's going to happen in 23. So now we're at the two new additions. Kicking off with the Lotus Amira. Obviously, we collected it from Lotus Heffel and just charged off to Europe in it. And that was a sink or swim moment for this car and how we're going to get on with it. The good news is when we got back, we loved it even more than when we set off. I am overjoyed with this car. It's, it's just a breath of fresh air. I've wanted to, to own a Lotus. I looked at Evora and I just couldn't push the button on it. I knew it was just a bit too extreme. It had too many annoying things for me. I have to say the visual pleasure for cars, the design, is a big reason why I own cars. And when you only got to look at the Lancia Zagato, it's just, that's, it, I want to open the door and go, wow. And the Amira does that for me, but it also backs it up with a huge amount of usability and just fun. It's just joyous. It's light and it handles, it, you, you know you're driving a Lotus as soon as you get behind the wheel. And I absolutely adore that. It also helps that Mrs. M has turned out to be a real fan of it. And so, yeah, I can see 23. This is just going to be my, my car. This is the one I'm going to use the most probably in the garage. When I bought it, I put a three year maintenance plan on it. So there's no bills for the next three years. That's the plan anyway. And I'm really chuffed. Another thing that really surprised me, I, you know, I'm insured, Footman James insure all the cars here. I have a group policy. And normally when I add a modern car to it, it's quite a chunk more. It's just the way it is. If I'm ins insuring a classic car, the little Lotus Elan or the Lancia, it's not much. It's, it's like a hundred pounds to add it to policy. Put a Project 8 on it, it was 1,456 pounds when I added the Project 8 to the policy. So I was expecting a sort of similar bill for the Lotus Amira. The cost, when I asked them to add it to the policy, it was 74 pounds 45 pence. I said, what? I actually asked them to check it. And they came back and said, no, there's very few claims with Lotus. That is the cost of adding it to the policy. £74 for the, well, it's not quite a year because my, ins my insurance renews in August and I put this on the policy in November. But for nine months, 10 months, £74. So there's another good reason to load a Lotus Amira. So the total cost for the insurance and on the policy, I checked 20 cars and 18 motorbikes for 2022 was 7,574 pounds. It's about 200 pounds less than last year. Not quite sure what dropped out, but uh, in short, slightly cheaper for 22. Lancia Fulvia. I'm so pleased to have this back. I am so chuffed with the color, everything about this car. All I've got to do now is add 500 miles to it and then they can tune the engine. It has a number of modifications. It's a bit spluttery low down. It's quite a cami engine and the engine will need setting up, which is I've just got a default setting in the electronic distributor for an engine map. It'll be straight on the rolling road and it'll all be sorted. So that's to come in 500 miles. But to see it here after that monster great restoration, 87,000 pounds, is a joy, absolute joy as you walk in the door and see it there. I can't get over there the same age, so I have two 72 cars. That had a service this year as, you know, 360 pounds, just went right through the car. I got someone else to do it rather than do it myself because I wanted them to, a second set of eyes is always useful. I think the little rubber donuts at the back might need changing or something like that, but that's to come. The Fiat 500 was a bit of a casualty of this year because I overspent on more than I expected on the Fulvia and on the Countach so that we didn't actually get the engine done on the little 500. And the other car that I haven't mentioned in here is the Testarossa, which I've taken down to have that body um, just modified, that bonnet fit. It didn't do anything really in 22 because it was due a belt service. And again, because of the spend on the Fulvia, on the Countach, I had to lay low with the Testarossa. So 2023 is going to be a year for the Testarossa, hopefully to come back on stream and we'll start using it a bit more. That's about it. The bike videos, I will do some more videos on the bikes when the weather improves. I've slimmed down the collection here 
for my Dakar bikes. These are the ones that really matter to me. I sold three at Silverstone auctions recently. Um, they did really well. I think there's an appetite for these, but these are the really special ones. Um, I'm having a bike built. I did Sand Raiders in 22. I'm booked in for 2023. I'm having a trick Yamaha TT 600, 1983 built. I had a, the weirdest looking bike you've ever seen. I bought it on a, a bit of a whim because I'd never seen one and the colors this was, and it was an early competition bike. And I thought, well, I'll have that and see what we're gonna do with it. It rode very well, looked disgusting. And I'm having that one rebuilt for Sand Raiders 23 because it's a very lightweight bike and they're retrofitting electric start to it and it should be about 130 kilos, which if you're into these sort of bikes, is very light for one of these. I think that's it for the roundup for 23. Thanks so much for watching all the videos. I think we're on for 28 million views for 2022. Uh, I've enjoyed doing the restorations and journeys with you. I'm trying to cut down the restorations for 23. Just going to finish off the Countess and finish off the uh, Testarossa as well. So that's the plan for this year. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, well, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming along very soon. Got a load of injectors down there. If you want to just do the engine, Charlie.